I will have to pray for safe journeys <laughs> for you all. Are you yeah. At least you're telling the kids six weeks we had now one time. We decided we can take the stage and every day we can take Yes, she is. Yeah, to Europe. Yeah. She still sat out probably in New York. Yeah, she's probably in the probably in the air now. What she's fine with? Switzerland. Switzerland, yeah. Yeah. Oh, good evening. Oh, sorry. It's a little, little bit early. I'm jumping the gun a little bit. Two more minutes. So surely it's a good thing we have a the Gators have a good field goal kicker, right? Yes, but what happened to him the first? <laughs> I know, I know. But yeah, 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 it's good. Not a lot of bragging rights yet, but we're hoping we stay mm. there. I don't know about this one. Uh, they're they're a tough team. Yeah. Well, good evening, everyone. I. Sorry to interrupt the conversation and fellowship. I I love it. Um, and we've got a lot to pray for and celebrate today. We're going to continue in the Minor Prophets with Amos or Amos or, you know, you know, most of us say Amos in English. And it's, I think we're in for an interesting study. It's always a challenging book in Amos. So I'm, lo I'm looking forward to what you all think our and where our discussion leads this app this evening, Amos. What are some prayer requests that we might have that we want to share this this uh, evening? I say this morning. You know, <laughs> I know this. It's it. You know, people will see me in the evening and say good morning, Pastor, because <laughs> <laughs> they're they're so used to sun, You know, Sunday. That's when they see so. Um, prayers for Bob Van Cura. Yes. Traveling mercies for several folks who are going to be traveling soon. Don and Donna. Um, 
My mother's traveling right now to Europe. So, Whoa. yeah. Yeah. She's going with a friend. So I think that would be a good thing. That's nice. Yes. No, just, no, not my mother-in-law, but my mother. My my mother, who was a flight attendant for many years and flew to these places in Europe, she was flight attendant with National Airlines, Air Florida, Eastern Airlines, and then was in airline management for years after that, various carriers. Mm -hmm. That explains how she carried herself. Yes, exactly. Yeah. The dress and customer service. And yeah, exactly. You got it right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> So, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Oh, Lord God, uh, I thank you for this time that we gather together, oh Lord, and uh, we pray for, for Bob, for healing, and for others that are on our heart, uh, for traveling mercies. And we ask, oh Lord, that you would illumine our hearts and lives through the study of your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to bounce around Amos to finish the book this evening. So we're going to be going chapter one, chapter two, chapter five, chapter six, and chapter eight and chapter nine. If we don't finish all of chapter nine, I won't be sad. We'll have made it through a good portion to give you the idea of Amos. And as always, it would encourage you to have, you know, in further delve into it. Bible study is supposed to encourage you to, you know, dip your toe in the water. We, we just go can go on a little bit. Um, there is a three-year cycle of readings for that many churches use called the lectionary. And if you were to go by the lectionary and worship and use all the lectionary passages, there's used, there can be an Old Testament, New Testament, Psalm reading, epistle, and a gospel reading, and you did that every Sunday for 52 weeks, and then some of the special uh, fest festivals like Ash Wednesday or Monday Thursday, Good Friday, you would still only hit about 25% of the Bible in worship. So many churches only get to about, you know, 25, 30% of the Bible in worship. And then if you're even in Bible study, you might probably, let's guess, another 25% more. So if you want to get the whole picture, you probably have to be doing some personal study. Um, <clears throat> but in any event, Amos it has some, is sometimes in worship, but sometimes not. It has a challenging message for churches. So let's see what we hear for us today. Amos chapter one. Amos is from the northern kingdom and he comes down to the southern kingdom of Judah. He's from the northern kingdom of Israel and he comes down to the southern kingdom of Judah to prophesy. He's a shepherd. Yeah, sorry. You, you all joining us online? Can you... What, Laura? No. This is the Bible study at my church. Oh. Uh, I paused him somehow. I went I went ahead, Richard, and sorry to mute you. I'm sorry. I got uh all righty. So you're welcome to unmute if you'd like to ask a question or participate. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of King Uzziah of Judah and in the days of King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, the Lord roars from Zion. And he utters his voice from Jerusalem, the pastures of the shepherd wither and the top of Carmel dries up. So right at the beginning, you have this understanding, this context that people after Amos have put this down. These are the words of Amos the prophet, but it's been dictated by somebody else. And there's some documentation 
after the fact of it being put down. So whether Amos himself did it, it's or one of his followers, it was done after after the prophecy. So you see here in, in the beginning, it says uh, of Joash of Israel two years before the earthquake. So they've given context to this. So therefore, it must have been put down on paper after sometime after this major earthquake had happened. Why is that important? Well, in prophecy in the Bible, particularly with the prophets, their validity, their authenticity often doesn't really reveal itself until after the fact. Whatever has been predicted has happened. So there may have been many prophets who came on the scene or whether, you know, and many of them could have been false prophets spouting all kinds of predictions and they didn't come true. But here's one who has given one who has given the word of the Lord. So in many ways, the only way you know is this going to come true is after the fact. That's the proof is in the pudding. Just like when Jesus in the Gospels predicts the, the destruction of the temple. He predicted that destruction of the temple, and it was memorable to his disciples, especially after the event had happened, which many feel as if the Gospels were written much later when many of these first disciples were dying out. There was a threat of persecution. They were concerned. What if this message that's being told from this eyewitness generation that has seen Jesus and this eyewitness generation dies or is martyred and it doesn't get written down? What are we going to do? So there was, there's always this sort of context and pressure in the Bible that we receive today. There's some, there is a, um, a process in a way that God has used to pass it down to us. So um, just an interesting note there. So, <clears throat> and he said, the Lord roars from Zion and he utters his voice from Jerusalem, the pastures of the shepherds wither and the top of Carmel dries up. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. So I will send a fire on the house of Hazael and shall devour the strongholds of Ben-Hadad. And I will break the gate bars of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Avin. And the one who holds the scepter from Bethi, Bethi then uh, and the people of Aram shall go into exile to cure. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they carried into exile entire communities to hand them over to Edom. So I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza, fire that shall devour its strongholds. I will, I will cut off the inhabitants from Ashdod and the one who holds a scepter from Ashkelon, and I will turn my hand against Ekron, and the remnants of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord. So the people of Aram are the Assyrians, and then these other, then it's the Philistines. So some event's going to happen for both the, the Assyrians and the Philistines. And in this time, Israel is in the middle of fights between larger, more powerful kingdoms. You have the Assyrians, uh, you have, and this is around the, the, ninth, the, eighth, the ninth to eighth century BC. So not quite the time of the Babylonians yet, which is, um, but around the time of when Egypt was prominent, Assyria, and um, even the Philistines. So that's just the context here. And he's, and he's saying that, you know, these kingdoms that we think are so powerful, they will collapse too. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they deliver entire communities over to Edom and did not remember the covenant of kinship. So I will send a fire on the wall of Tyre, fire that shall devour its strong souls. Thus says the Lord, for the three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity. He maintained his anger perpetually and kept his wrath forever. So I will send a fire on Timon and it shall devour the strongholds of Basra. Thus says the Lord, for, the trans for three transgressions of the Ammonites and for four, 
I will not revoke the punishment because they have ripped open pregnant women in Gilead in order to enlarge the territory. So I will kill, kindle a fire against the wall of Rabbah and fire that shall devour its strongholds with shouting on the day of battle, with a, with a storm on the day of the whirlwind. Then their king shall go into exile and he and his officials together. So the Edomites and the Ammonites are other Semitic peoples that are in this land. You know, you could possibly lump them together with the, the Canaanites. In fact, the, Can the Canaanites would have been an all-encompassing term for the people of this region in which Israel inhabited. A lot of people, you know, wonder, well, when Joshua came in and, and the land was conquered, did the Canaanites disappear? No, not necessarily. There were still these other tribes that Israel knew that they were so closely related to. The Edomites, um, for example, Esau uh, is an um, ancestor of the Edomites. Uh, the Ammonites have a close kinship and relationship, which we find out about. Um, the Moabites, these other Canaanite tribes have this affiliation um, with Israel. Uh, it's it, 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 and at some point, there is even some, uh, what you call it, when, you're, when your language is, is different, but you can understand it. Like when you know Spanish, and then you know Latin or, or Romance language. Because, so the, the Canaanite language and the Hebrew language, ancient Hebrew, were somewhat partially mutually intelligible even though you know, they wrote in different alphabets and things. So they shared some cultural characteristics. That was why there was always this risk of assimilation. And God tried to keep them separate. And then we always wonder in the Old Testament, well, it was so harsh. They're so brutal. You know, God is asking them to do these brutal things. Why is God um, authorizing this? Is he blessing this? It's not that God is blessing this, but the, the extinction of these people who are supposed to be part of God's salvation plan is, is always possible without God's protection and his instruction it, because they live in a time where it's killed or be killed. You know, um, so we all, we wonder, is it getting worse now? Or is it, you know, human beings have always had some, you know, serious issues, <laughs> you know, since the fall of, of humanity, um, since sin entered the world. So this is a kill or be killed kind of world that, that Israel find itself in. And even that they themselves as 12 tribes can't even get along. So they have two different, two different kingdoms that have some loose affiliation, you know. And when things are going well, they both can agree to worship in Jerusalem. When they're not, the northern kingdom is building all kinds of altars all around the kingdom. And in some ways, this leads them astray and toward idolatry. Um, so let's continue in chapter two. Thus says the Lord for three transgressions in Moab and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because he, he burned to lime the bones of the king of Edom. So I will send a fire on Moab and it shall devour the strongholds of Kiriath and Moab shall die amid uproar and amidst shouting and the sound of the trumpet. I will cut off the ruler from its midst and I will kill all the officials with him, says the Lord. But lest we think that in this whole context of Canaan, that Israel and Judah are exempt, now we find out what the judgment on Judah and Israel is. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have rejected the law of the Lord and they have not kept his statutes, but they have been led astray by the same lies after which their ancestors walked. So I will send a fire on Judah, and it shall devour the strongholds of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, they who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and push the afflicted out of the way. Father and son, go to the same girl, so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge, and in the house of their God they drink, wine brought with fines they impose. Yet I destroyed the Amorites 
the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of cedars and who was as strong as oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. And I brought you up out of the land of Egypt and led you 40 years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And I raised up some of your children to be prophets and some of your youths to be Nazirites. It is not indeed so, O people of Israel, says the Lord. Nazirite. So a Nazirite would be somebody who at birth, the parents dedicated with a special vow that they should not do certain things. Like, for example, drink any any alcohol or fruit of the vine or uh, cut their hair or eat, you know, certain things like honey, depending on the kind of vow. But most, mainly it's about, you know, not necessarily shearing the hair and not drinking. Exactly. I was going to say that. Yes. So Samson was, is an example of, of someone whose parents made a Nazarite vow. And as a result of that vow, dedicated that child to God, that God's that God endowed Samson with a special gift of his strength. But when his hair was cut and you know the beard was you know shaved, uh, it broke the vow. It broke the vow. So it sim Sam Samson symbolizes in a person this kind of the the possibilities of a covenant, but also the shortcomings of a covenant with God and why we needed a new covenant through Jesus. You know, that, that, that we would like to do it on our own. We'd like to have our own power, but where does the power ultimately come from? It comes from God. Um, so in other words, if you, if you have all these vows and you're making them and then you don't fulfill them, you know, what good is your word and your bond? You know, and should should the one who is who also made promises to you keep the promises, or there are there consequences to cheat to teach you to try and bring you back uh, to a you know a renewed covenant. Um, <clears throat> a lot of Amos talks about hypocrisy, and hypocrisy is not one of those you know, fun subjects. But just so you understand the ancient kind of idea of hypocrisy in the Greek, a hypocrite is somebody who in the theater would wear a mask and play a part. Uh, so it wasn't originally a word that had a bad meaning, but it became something that meant that somebody was not authentic. Somebody was not telling the truth, was, you know, sort of putting on a show, putting on airs. Um, which is what, you know, like Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount talks about praying, how the Pharisees will pray in public, you know, and how he looks down on that and says, go to the closet, pray in private, because that's more authentic expression. Who are you doing this for, the people, or are you doing it for God? And so as we move on through these chapters, we're going to see a lot more discussion about hypocrisy. So I will press down on you in your place, just as a cart presses down when it is full of sheaves. Flight, uh, flight shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall not retain their strength, nor shall the mighty save their lives. Those who handle the bow shall not stand. Those who are swift of foot shall not save themselves, nor shall those who ride horses save their lives. And those who are stout of heart among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day. All right. So that just gives you an idea of the judgment that's that's coming for this whole entire region, mired in com war and conflict. Who, yeah. I just curious the question. How do you think he delivered these messages? No, you deliver in a very public forum. In one place, or is that? You know, I, I, I would, you know, I, I would guess that he would go directly to the royal court and deliver this, you know, so that it puts his life at risk, which is why many of the prophets would, um, you know, be put to death. 
you know, we have record of some of the, you know, them being threatened with their lives, but not of others. Or it could be delivered in the company of profits. And then the profits, it is in a company of profits, there's like a prophetic guilt. They each, you know, are, you know, bringing their prophecy that they've heard into this forum. And then, then they go and share it with other people. So it could have been in all those those um, places. But it's highly likely that I feel like this was done in a royal in a royal court in a royal context. You know, it's as if the sentence is being issued to these nations, and so the place to issue that that and who's being held most accountable for this of a nation is is the um, is the royalty, is the nobility, the leaders of this. I don't know. What do you feel? As if what what is your sense? Or you well, I don't know. I was just looking. Thinking about, hmm. The distances between some are these all in well, he would. All in the same place I, or, I don't think he would go to these foreign countries and de, and deliver this. I mean, I think that it would be done in in the midst of in the midst of the court in Judah. He came. He comes down from Israel to Judah, as best as the scholarly consensus says. And why is he delivering judgment about other foreign kingdoms to put it in context? Because these are all other tribes and chiefdoms and kingdoms that Israel and Judah, especially Judah, where he's delivering that, have placed their faith and trust in their alliances uh, with these other chiefdoms and these other countries. And essentially, they can all be laid to God can lay them all the ways. So why are you placing your faith there? You've been faithful to them and keeping your promises with them, but you've not been keeping your promises with God. And so I think that's supposed to, to get the, you know, the problem with alliances or something like say, even, you know, I mean, NATO is in the news a lot, but, and I'm not, you know, saying anything about, NATO or whatever it means, but just know that if a country joins NATO and then one country declares, another country outside of NATO declares war on a NATO country, uh, all the other countries in that alliance are supposed to then therefore declare war on that other country. And that's really like, you know, those kinds of alliances, those network of alliances are supposed to be a deterrent and yet not if you're not careful they can you know cascade into uh, a world war or, or a whole regional conflict and so i think there's some god's trying to give the, the kings of israel some diplomatic advice you you've placed your faith in the in the wrong in the wrong sort of ruling and the kingship you've you've sought to cultivate your diplomatic or your military skills when you offer no spiritual leadership or guidance to the people I mean, that's my, I don't know, that's my take on, on, on the, you know. And... Well, I was just thinking of the drama of the situation. They ran in Israel and I hear a prophet and castigating all of my neighbors. Yeah. I'm going to be feeling pretty good. And then all of a sudden, he made the planet. Well, well, sure. That is a, yeah, you've got a good point about the drama of it. You know, all the the king would be hearing it. It's like, almost as like a a uh, when you're gonna give somebody some bad feedback, you give them a sandwich. Have you ever heard of the sandwich method? Method. You're like, all right, give them some good things first, but then you tell them the reality that that's not very good, and then you but you end it with something good. So you you know you so, trying to soften the blow, or at least you get them so that they'll listen initially, and then this is what I really need to tell to you. You know, I really need to tell you, uh, Judah, you think you've all these other ones? Well, you're in the same boat. Yeah, there's no exceptionalism here. I think that's the, the drama that you're pointing out there, which is uh, very absurd. So um, now it's confusing in Amos and the other prophets when they use the term Israel. They're sometimes using the all, it's sometimes a terminology for all 12 tribes. 
And then sometimes it refers to the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. And then sometimes you'll see one tribe mentioned for the Northern Kingdom and one tribe mentioned for the Southern Kingdom. So the Southern Kingdom is easy to identify because it did Judah. And there's Judah and Benjamin, and that's the Southern tribe. But the Northern tribe is often hard because like I said, it's synonymous with Israel, which mean all 12 tribes or this people who worshiped as one true God, these descendants of Jacob, or it can mean the Northern Kingdom, or even the Northern Kingdom can be referred to, as we saw last week in Joel, as Ephraim, you know, one of the sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, these sub-tribes. So here in this chapter five, I'm going to say that it's, it's referring to all 12 tribes, lumping them together, and the lack of unity that they have. Let's move to chapter 5 and in verse 1. Hear this word that I take up over you in lamentation, O house of Israel. Fallen no more to rise as maiden Israel, forsaken on her land, with no one to raise her up. For thus says the Lord, the city that marched out a thousand shall have a hundred left, and that which marched out a hundred shall have ten left. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel and do not enter Gilgal and, or cross over to Beersheba. For Gilgal shall surely go into exile and Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, or we will break out against the house of Joseph like fire and it will devour Bethel with no one to quench it. Ah, you that turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground. So now this is, in this paragraph, it's a reference to specifically the northern kingdom, the house of Joseph. Uh, <clears throat> the one who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns the deep darkness into morning and darkens the day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name, who makes destruction flash out against the strong so that destruction comes upon the fortress. And uh, let's move to verse 18 in chapter 5. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light, as if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light and gloom with no brightness in it? So, as Denman pointed out, you could easily gloat over the destruction of your enemies and say, great, they're getting their comeuppance, and this initiates a day of the Lord. In other words, judgment, good. They're getting their recompense, the recompense for the wicked. Oh, no, by the way, you're in the boat, too. You know, that, that, that kind of um, irony that is turned on them. And then God issues this uh, strong um, judgment. I hate, I despise your festivals and take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Did you bring to me sacrifices and offering the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You shall take up uh, Sakoth, your king, and Kawain, Kawan, your star god, your images, which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will take you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. And or, in other words, the Assyrians are going to take over that, that northern kingdom. This, this is a prediction that comes true after um, Amos's prophetic work. Um, in 732 or 7, uh, I, I think I misquoted it last week. I said 722. It's, it's either 732 or 733 B.C. It just fluctuates by year because of the way the Jewish year falls. 
And then 586 and 587 is when the southern kingdom of Judah goes into exile to the Babylonians. So the, this is why we talk about in the northern kingdom, when they disappear and they go off the scene, they, they don't get mentioned again as tribes. You just really see the tribe of Judah mentioned or the tribe of Benjamin, but you don't hear, or the tribe of Levi, you don't hear uh, about, you know, Manasseh, Zebulun, Issachar, Asher, Gad, Dan, um, Reuben, any of the other 10 tribes. That's why they sometimes term it that mystery of the Bible, the 10 lost tribes. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever thought about that. You know, where did they go? What did they become of them? Um, some people say that the, the remnant that remained and carried on the religious traditions of the Northern Kingdom was the, the Samaritans. So it's possible that they didn't disappear, but they somewhat assimilated, somewhat carried on, and they weren't acknowledged by Judah because they refused to worship the one true God in Jerusalem. They worshiped him in, uh, you know, else, elsewhere on um, Mount Gerizim, which would have been in their northern region. Um, <clears throat> So I want to kind of take a moment to reflect on this, uh, you know, this strong statement that comes from the word, is the word of Lord coming from the prophet. If you heard this as, uh, let's say, a worshiping community, I hate, I despise your festivals and take no delight in your solemn assemblies, even though your offerings you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon them. Where, what you, how would you feel if that word came to you? Oh, wind and gloom. Yeah. Really? I know. Now where do I go? Yeah. I know where I go. I'm not... I'm not, it's disapproving. I, I'm not pleased with what you're doing. You're, a, you're not getting a good report card. <laughs> you know? um, and, I, and I think that there's a sense to where the hypocrisy is there. They're doing it outwardly, but are they really, do they really have the relationship with God inwardly? They're using him as a towel. Yeah. They're hedging their bets, uh -huh. right? And if we do that, you'll, you'll, you'll understand it. Mm -hmm. Do you really mean what you're doing? Yeah. We had a district superintendent some years ago. No names mentioned. And we had a joint charge conference with district wide meeting and uh, district superintendent did this kind of thing. Mm. Said, no, this church is not doing you're not doing you're not doing very awkward situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, prophecy being having prophetic a prophetic ministry. So sometimes they talk about that is how do you see anybody have a prophetic ministry? And most of the time we're talking about, you know, future telling or fortune telling. But how many would want a prophetic ministry of telling a hard truth uh, that nobody wants to hear? You know, is there is that needed? Um, how do you tell people truth in a way that they will hear it or not hear it? Or what? What is your role when you do it? Or are you just supposed to state it if God lays it on your heart and leave or risk your life for it? So um, what are some, say, truths that people just don't want to hear? I mean, you could think about it personally or even in a society, you know, if you want to answer. <laughs> just curious. Well, before you got here, the DS said you, the minister that you love will move. Uh, right, right. We're we're doing. I'm we're doing this, and you better accept it. You're gonna like it. You know. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, your um, age is that a, is that a uh, reality or truth we don't want to accept or mortality? Absolutely, it's not a comfortable subject, not a joy filled subject. <laughs> yeah. Um, other, you know, and there's lots of other ones that I can think of, but that if we don't confront them, if we're not humble enough, God will remind us of them anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that there's, there's a sense. Um, I think of, for me, one thing that is we can easily insult, insulate ourselves at times from the suffering suffering that that goes on around us in our community you know now this church does a great job in responding to the needs of our community you know with feeding uh people who are in need um but but i would say in general if i had to think about mount dora and i thought about the problems of homelessness and you know i think some of you have even talked to me about it you know what you know if you're home, if you are homeless, you will be sent to Eustace, or you will find yourself a bus ticket either to Lake County Jail, or you will go to uh, you will go to Leesburg, or you will be sent to Apopka or somewhere else. You're not going to stick around Mount Dora. And um, you know, and then if we were to say, well, what? How do we house people? Well, let's build a let's build a homeless shelter somewhere in Mount Dora. And let's say that, that this happened and, and churches got together and said that they want to do it and brought it to council. What do you think would, would happen? Well, the neighbors would be against it. Maybe that's what they asked. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. They're not going to do it. You know, they wanted to put one in use. And they not yeah, it's like, well, Mount Dora, you don't want to do it, so why should we? <laughs> right, they at least have the the day shelter the life and life's open door which we support um but yeah go this leesburg's thing that's not our thing you know so those that's an uncomfortable truth to talk about you know but all of us at some point when we can name this truth that we don't want to talk about can think of some way that it's affected us personally um we've known someone in our family or someone we care about who's ended up homeless but we don't want to admit it because you know it's hard to talk about. So sometimes the, the work of the prophet is needed and um, they need to talk about how they've drifted from God. We, we've gone far away from God and we all know it, but we're, we're not telling it to each other. That's how deception works, you know? Um, well, let's go ahead and move to chapter seven because I know I skipped chapter six, but I think that uh, we won't get to some of the juicy parts if, uh, yeah. This is what the Lord God showed me. He was forming locusts at the time. The, the latter growth began to sprout. It was latter growth after the king's mowing. When they had finished eating the grass of the land, I said, oh, Lord God, forgive, I beg you. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord God was calling out for a shower of fire. Uh, and it devoured the great deep and was eating the land. Then I said, O oh Lord God, cease, I beg you. How come Jacob scanned? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. He, this also should not be, said the Lord. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside the wall built with a plumb plum line with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid to waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So the plumb line is 
a carpentry tool. And it's used to uh, keep a, a house um, basically straight. If you're trying to build a frame, it's used to make sure that the frame is straight. If someone can correct me, uh, uh, what's that? Vertical. Yeah, like vertical, but like square. square. Yeah, yeah, it's a square. It's a type of way to square the, you know, the frame. Square the horizon, but the vertical in the center. We're having straight up and down, no matter what the landscape is falling. Right. You can. You can tell us up and down a plum if you line up by sight, your eye will see the company you know is plum in the distance. You can tell if it's off just, just by line of sight, it's the angle. Yeah, imagine. Well, is there anything here that they don't want? Is there anything about it? Is it 60 ounce bread plum off? Not too many people have one there. Cool it's a string with a little, yeah, thing. Right. Now we use a now we use a level or a bubble, you know, laser level. You know, we have these other technologies that kind of thing. But I'm gonna, you know, keep you level and solid. Um, yeah. So here's. Here's the yeah. Yeah, sometimes you you know something but you don't know a name for it. And you know, because I can remember go get the string. I might have when they said that that it was the string with the weight on it. Yeah. But they didn't say plum on because I was thinking piece of fruit when I was young. Right. <laughs> and then when I got older, they still said go get the string, and I knew what they meant. But because they were simplifying when I was little, and then it just carried through. Right. So here's the context of of Amos. How we know he went to. Actually, I got it reversed. He was from the south in Judah, and he comes up to the north. So this is the this is where we know the context that it's in the it's in the court. Uh, in verse ten here, it says, uh, "Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel." Uh, this is Bethel's in the northern kingdom, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from this land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go flee away to this land of Judah. Earn your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel. For it is the king's sanctuary and is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered to Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock. And the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You, you say, do not prophesy against Israel and there do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword, and your land shall be parceled out by line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile from, away from its land. Ouch. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you're just basically hearing that your whole country or kingdom, as you know it, is going to collapse. You know, and there's no room or nothing that you can do about it. It's as if this is it's too late. There's no there's no repent, you know, this is the what it's going to be. Um, you know, don't shoot the messenger, and yet the, he is the bearer of bad news. So um, yeah. The bet uh now chapter eight. This is what the Lord God showed me: a basket of summer fruit. He said, Amos. What do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day, says the Lord. The dead bodies shall be many, out, cast out in every place. Be silent. Hear this, you that trample on the needy and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, what will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath so that we may offer wheat for sale? 
We will make the ephah small and the shekel great and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the, the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account and everyone mourn who lives in it and all of it rise like the Nile and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt. On that day, says the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on all your loins and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. This time is surely coming, says the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north uh, to east and shall run to and fro seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. In that day, the beautiful young women and the young men shall faint for thirst. Those who swear by Ashima of Samaria and say, as your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. Um, so, <clears throat> this, so the prophecy has been issued for the people of Israel, but there's also another prophecy here about the famine of the word. So how does the famine of the word become fulfilled? What, what is that concept? So, so many scholars take a look at this prophecy about the famine of the word and say that it possibly corresponds to after the prophet Daniel, there's not, not another prophet that, that is um, raised again, you know, or, or, um, or even, my, or the prophet um, Micah. There's no, there are no prophets after about 400 uh, BC. And so about 400 BC to, um, you know, first century AD. Um, now Jesus birth probably occurred in five B, uh, four BC. Um, there was no prophet that rose again until who was the prophet that broke the famine of the word? Who that John the Baptist? So 400 years, 400 years of a famine of the word. How many years was uh, Egypt or it was Israel? Yeah, the 400 years in bondage in Egypt. So this this bondage doesn't just have to be a physical bondage. It can be a spiritual bondage, where you know if you turn your back on God. Um, you know, the, you take for granted the blessing of, of hearing from God directly, uh, it, it will be withdrawn. And I don't know what's far worse, the, the exile of Israel being taken away or for Judah just to kind of wallow in a time where they don't get to hear from directly from God anymore. I mean. You don't realize you miss no what you miss until you don't have it. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and then this is the sort of, let's kind of go to the part that's good news because how you know it's authentic prophecy is yes, there's doom and gloom, but there is restoration and renewal that's presented. So in Amos, there's not a lot of it, but in this last part of chapter nine, uh, 11 through 15, on that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. And in order that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this. The time is surely coming, says the Lord, when the one who plows shall overtake the one who reaps and the treader of grapes, the one who sows the seed and the mountains shall Drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make their gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them upon their land, and they shall never again be plucked up out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. Yeah. And, uh, this booth of David, this uh, tabernacle or 
you know, of David that's going to be raised up? What what do you think that prophecy is about? Mm -hmm. Yes, good. It is the obvious Sunday school answer, you know. Yeah. <laughs> No. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't mean it that in a bad way. I, I always have this joke about, um, you know, when you're in Sunday school, 70% of the time, if you answer Jesus, you're going to get the right answer. <laughs> no, but Jesus came from David's. That gave, Jesus came from David's line, yeah. the line, the line of David, you know, the stump of Jesse, this idea of the stump of Jesse, um, you know, that's, that's presented in Isaiah, you know, it, even though it's cut off, even if a if a tree is cut off, if the stump is strong and good, a sapling can rise from that stump. And so again, if the house, the, the Lord can raise up the house, even if it's fallen and bring it back again, he can reestablish his rule uh, and he will do it. And he, and the land will once again be fruitful. And, it, and it's not just physical fruitfulness, it's fruitfulness of what was there a famine of before, of God's word, uh, of, of people knowing God, of knowing righteousness and knowing right from wrong. See, brothers and sisters, one of the things I find about this talk of uh, hypocrisy is um, when people don't know right from wrong, uh, part of the problem is that they're, they're so confused that they don't know up from down anymore. You know, there's no sense of limits, boundaries, um, you know, and it becomes so disorienting and confusing that it just a house or a society can collapse in on, on itself. There needs to be some plumb line to keep things guided and straight, you know? What's that? Plumb line is, so to speak, on the square. Don't they know that they need to correct people? Well, I, I, I think the problem is, is that we would want to lie to ourselves, you know, that, um, you know, or, or not just ourselves, you know, I mean, all of us can at times, as I said, indicated with certain truths that we don't, we want to deny about ourselves, but as a society as a whole, you know, well, poverty is a problem, but somebody else will do something about it, you know? Our education system's a problem, and you know somebody else will do something about it. Yeah. 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 You see that some people do you believe that there are people that actually don't know the difference between right and wrong? And the or is it just disagree? Is a wrong person that's one that right. disagrees with us? Or is is that a wrong person? Well, or or there's an indication is that we let the sun, or they self-deception. I mean, there's a process of self-deception where we, you know, like Cain, for example, the, he's an example in scripture of somebody who came to an offering with God and felt as if his offering was right, but God knows there was something wrong and said, you know, sin is crouching at your door, desires to master you. And the proof is in the pudding. He's He killed his brother Abel out of, the, out of the jealousy. There was something brewing with him. And it didn't just happen overnight. Like it it only takes a degree. The plum rhyme reminds us that uh, we live in, when we do wrong, we do it by degrees. And then we drift, we will drift off course and we drift, drift, drift till we don't even know where, how far off we are. Um you know, so I, I mean, I think that in in Amos, as difficult as it is to face the reality, is that some of the things that are talked about uh, about the the greed, um, you know, uh, that seem to be indicated are um, are in a, are present in in our in our world today. You know, um, someone will look at you and go, "What you say is true," but you know, there are all these exceptions. Yeah. You know, if yeah. you exist, you, you've got to understand that they, they and there aren't really exceptions there. Right. That's how we see it. Plus, I think that today's kids, today's society, even adults now, we are seeing it and we're being influenced. 
uh, like we said before, what time? I'm worth it. Do what I'm Give me what I am worth it. I'm special. Because this is what's being broadcast. This is what. Sure. And we miss the, the truth. Well, we're being dis we're also being distracted from a broader conversation about a lot of things. I mean, you know, I know that many of us, you know, are skeptical about things, and there's this, there's a distrust in government and all these institutions, but it's eroded so much that the house is gonna the house of cards is gonna fall at some point. When no matter what party is what, people don't trust each other, there's no working, our government is gonna be shut down. And we may think, well, we got through a shutdown before, it'll be fine. But at one one point, it'll be such a tipping point that it'll you know we won't we won't like the results of it. And part of it is the truth that nobody in Congress would ever want to say. And that that's I think a prophet like Amos would come into the hall in Congress and say, "Is you all are being um, paid so handsomely under the table to do what you're doing? That is the money and greed is so corroded this this government." that um, the only way to, to get anything done is to bribe and to, and to go under the table, to go backhanded, to get a lobbyist, um, you know, that. And so something that might help the whole situation like campaigns finance reform would never ever be bought up in the halls of Congress, Democrat, Republican, independent, because there's too many people making too much money off each other in Washington. But, um, <laughs> You know, and that's the kind of thing that prophecy that Amos would bring, and that's what he's bringing to Israel. Is you all are so corrupt, it, it's it's and it, it will it will collapse. You know, and that so that's the kind of thing that we don't want to hear. That's I mean I've been naming a truth and a reality, but we're I I fear for my children. Oh yeah, you have a very good life to fear for. So anyhow, I think every generation. No shame. No yeah. shame. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's a that's a blank statement, but you're right. But there are some blanket statements of prophecy that but the part of the problem is shame doesn't produce change. The only probably the only thing that produces change is when you have to pick up the pieces. And that and that's what the prophecy kind of reveals the cycle of. You know, it's not until we get into a famine or we get into um, a hurricane or an earthquake that would change building codes. And it's probably not until the system reaches a tipping point to where we will try finally make a change that's needed and, you know, do certain things like, you know, campaign finance reform or term limits or, or whatever might be needed to reform and reshape a, a democracy that's become an oligarchy or corrupted by money and greed and special interests. Greed. Yeah. Greed. So in any event, I've got it on my soapbox. I'm sorry. No. But Amos gave me permission to go there. Yeah. Well, um, I'll let our friends online go and we can have some prayer requests.